uh, Latanya Sweeney it runs the Data Privacy Lab at Harvard. Ethan Zuckerman runs the Center for Civic Media at the MIT Media Lab. I don't think we need it. And uh, they're going to do a duet. So <laughs> come on down, Ethan and Latanya. I... Hey. So just before anything else, man, I love Susan, Susan Crawford. Can we just get another yeah. round of applause? Susan is one of the most optimistic people I know, but what I love about Susan's optimism is that it has a vision of possible futures we could choose with technology. Mm -hmm. And I think for Latanya and me, we're always looking at these critical questions of what decisions are we making about these systems? What are we choosing to embrace? What are we choosing to reject? And that's very much what we wanted to think about, but it's just amazing uh, to have someone put up such a... Um, Ethan's trying to nicely say we're the downers. No, and so in some ways, I, I wanted to start with that with you because, um, Latonya, you scare me. And, and like, not as, a, <laughs> not as a person, but as a researcher. Like, a lot of the things that I've been most scared about over the last 10, 20 years of the internet have sort of come out of your research. <laughs> I learned about your work for the first time when you found my governor's anonymized medical files and basically said, yeah, medical anonymity? Yeah, forget about that. Doesn't, doesn't really happen. So given the chance to share a stage with you, I wanted to ask, what were you scared about 10 years ago? What are you scared about now? So the, the governor medical record was 20 years ago. Okay. Pretty amazing. All right. All right. Uh, 30 years ago, maybe 1997. Yeah. Um, and but but 10 years ago in 2007, the th thing that uh, I was working on then was a simple idea that you could uh, type SSN Vitae into a Google search bar, and you would see people's social security numbers. Let me give you an example. And that's because people would put their resumes online and there was a habit of putting their date of birth and their social security number as part of that resume. So I built a little, uh, so <clears throat> it's not that I'm a downer for the sake of just depressing yeah, people yeah, yeah. or making them feel creepy. This is real stuff. Well, it's also because I'm a computer scientist by training and the, the goal is how do you get to Susan's real world with, if you don't look at what the unforeseen consequences are and address them? And so, um, so this clearly was an unforeseen consequence. And with the rising amount of identity theft and credit card fraud, um, I wrote an AI program that would go around finding these online, figuring out if they could get an email address for the same person, sending them an email, and encouraging them to take them down. What, what happens when you send someone that email? Well, when it first started, people would, uh, People accused us of stealing their identity. Sure, And sure. people threatened to sue me, and you know, why was I stealing their social security number, things like that. But after about a year, uh, it had run, and then about two years, media from around the country started picking up about the program. Uh, by 2007, you, would be, you really couldn't find them online at all. So, so this doesn't happen anymore. This is all set, you fixed it, you wrote a program, this never happens anymore, and we've solved this particular bug with identity theft. In 2007. But in 2017, as my students pointed out to me in the spring, they're back. So that one didn't work so well. <laughs> so so it, is that what we're worried about now in 2017? Are we worried about we didn't learn these lessons 10 years ago, we're still releasing data, we're putting it all over the place, personally identifiable information keeps showing up. Is that, is that our contemporary? Well, I certainly, it certainly is a con an ongoing problem. You know, also in 2007, Facebook was uh, moving beyond campuses and coming into the real world. And one of the things that it did is it required date of birth and yeah. zip, uh, date of birth and home, uh, birthplace, hometown. And we had learned that you could actually predict social security numbers, digits of a person's social security number from those two fields. And all of our attempts to get Facebook to stop making that public had all failed. And so, um, so in 2007, one of the things we were really interested in is why is it that for anyone born from 1987 to 2011, your social security numbers 
are uh, some given out at date of birth, and they're sequential in your state. And so, in fact, you can figure out uh, when a person was born from date of birth in, in hometown. So you would think that that would be the thing that would, would really... Would seem like a vulnerability. Yeah. yeah, it would seem like a vulnerability. Um, so we did get the Social Security Administration to stop doing that issuance. for So newborns don't have it, but anyone here who is in that time period, yours are predictable, and we can talk... Uh, and we can predict it if you like. Um, so, but the Knight Foundation gave us a grant to figure out a little bit more at another deeper level, what are the flows of personal information? Like yeah. where, all, where is the information really and, um, and where might it all come from? And so it was 2016, it was an election year. We were interested in uh, the kind of information that you find on election website. There, are thir there were 36 states had websites uh, where if you were a voter, you could go and you could change your information. But how do those websites know you're you? They know you're you by you're the one who has to provide the name, yep. address, and date of birth, or name, date of birth, and zip code, or, um, or your social security number, or something like that. And so we were interested in where might all the places be that we could get it. And we found no shortage of them, 500 and some odd places, making it very easy to impersonate voters online. Not to mention the fact that uh, Facebook reminds me every day who's had a birthday, usually how old they are, <laughs> giving me the birth date, the year, and going for it. And if I know something about the hometown, I'm in pretty good place to, uh, to guess that at that point. Yeah. And, you know, uh, and it wasn't very expensive to automate to change the voter information on those 36 websites. So for less than, for around $10,000, you could change 1% of all the voter registrations in, in nationwide. So, so you're saying that Donald Trump is right, and that in fact um, millions and millions of people uh, may be voting illegally using this scheme to go in and change the information and that you're capable of doing this for, for just a few thousand dollars. We're saying for 10,000 people you can do the opposite. That is, instead of accounting for people uh, additional votes, this is a way to disenfranchise millions of people from not being able to get their vote to count. But let's so tell you, you, no one would ever want to prevent anyone from voting. Well, so... <laughs> And it's kind of an interesting system, too, because if you change a person's address on their voter registration, they go to the polling place that they've been going to for years, only now they're not on the polling register, so they're said that you can't vote here. They start yelling and screaming, so they give them a provisional ballot, except provisional ballots don't count in most states. So it's kind of a pacifier effect that at the same time can really have a dramatic impact on a sort of undercount. So it's the opposite of the voter fraud conversation that we typically hear about new people voting, it's more like a, a new kind of suppression of vote. So simply by having this much personally identifiable information yeah. available through various different data brokers who tend to be lightly registered, here's an attack that for almost no money makes it possible to functionally prevent large numbers of people from voting and it can be geographically targeted, which suggests that you could also make it demographically or psychographically targeted. Exactly. That, that was our finding. Cool. I'm worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in the, when I look over that arc from 2007 and identity, the work with Identity Angel, that program, coming forward, what we see are sort of this notion that these problems aren't, haven't really been addressed and that they're just getting worse. And instead of there being just financial harm, now you're talking about other kinds of institutions uh, failing and so forth. And so, um, but we just tend to sort of ignore it and it just seems to keep on happening. It would be nice if there was some way to get control of some of this. So, um, Michelle Shaglowski is someone who's been writing really passionately about what he thinks is wrong with the advertising supported web. And one of the analogies that he started putting out is that every company says, we're going to collect your data. It's going to be an amazing asset. We're going to make a ton of money off of it. He suggests that you think about your data as toxic waste. <laughs> Here's a, something that you have as sort of a necessary byproduct of what you're doing, but it's your job to dispose of it as safely and carefully as possible before it essentially melts down and destroys your business. Who, who's right? Are these businesses that are making enormous amounts of money trying to figure out how to broker data, are they handling this the right way or should we be looking at this as something that, that frankly is, is pretty terrifying for a lot of people to touch? 
Well, I'm definitely saying on the terrifying side. And the reason for that, and the reason for that is really quite simple. You know, um, data, you know, the social contract made by companies like Google and then on to Facebook, this idea of data for service, is a model that says your data's worth, worth nothing until they figured a way to monetize yep. it and you get it in exchange, this service. Except for one problem, and that is, you ever try to get data out of Google or yeah. Facebook? They don't give it to anyone. It was free when it came in the door, but good luck trying to get it out of there. Well, right? suddenly they made it valuable. They, right, now all of a sudden it's incredibly valuable. And this social contract is also changed with the Internet of Things. Now I don't get free service. I buy the device. The device still has all the data. And so now that social contract is even changing where I'm now paying, and they still get to keep my data, and I don't get a copy of it. And so, um, so th these, this underscores to us the value of the data. It also, the work that, that I just talked about that we've been doing also underscores the vulnerability that it mm -hmm. leaves us all in. And right now, the keepers of the data and the ones who are making the most money on it have an incentive to keep data free, which is why things like in the, um, oh, sorry, Ethan. I think back one, yeah. Um, <coughs> No, well, it doesn't go backwards. No? Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, one of the things that you saw was uh, you could get the, a database for five hundred dollars that had the social security numbers of all Americans. That's pretty amazing. So that's Good deal. right, exactly. But when a but a company will take it and when they take it and they monetize it, uh, this becomes additional resources for businesses. And there are many data analytic companies where their products. Well, let me say it differently. We are the product. Yeah. Our data really is the product and so forth. So it, is, there, is there good news at the end of this? Do you have the solution the way you had 10 years ago, a script that was able to go out and sort of help people realize how dangerous this Vitae behavior was? Is there, are, are you going to let everyone who know, uses the internet right now know how dangerous it is to use any number of services that are grabbing PII? Where, where do we go with this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I don't have an answer. I don't have that uh, answer. And the, the program worked for a while, but then when we stopped using the program, it seemed like the resumes came back and the vulnerabilities came back and the number of new sources are, are, are much larger. It seems like there has to be a more, a larger answer. And maybe part of it is finding ways for, for people to get control of their own data. Maybe it's a way for people to have more control uh, offering platforms that offer more control. So that's a, a direction that we've been looking in. And would that be would that be like decentralized social networks? Is that sort of going in the direction of something like a diaspora? Is that a brokerage model like folks like Doc Searles have been trying? I have my data, I can put it out and you might get access to it if you give me certain privileges coming out of it. How, how do we how do we do that? Well, I don't have any answers. Check back with me, not in 10 years, but maybe okay. in two. Okay. But um, we keep meaning to have good reasons to subject. get together what for dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What are you yeah. doing? What are you doing? So, well, on look. I, <laughs> so I, I maybe I'm more hopeful than you are today. I, I um, so I was thinking about ten years ago as well. And what I was working on ten years ago was this question of who gets to speak online. I'd done a bunch of research with uh, Hal Roberts, John Palfrey, Jill York, a couple of other folks over at the Berkman Center, now the Berkman Klein Center, uh, around censorship. And I was really interested in this idea that the internet, which this global open space, was getting shut down in Iran, in China. We did a whole bunch of work on, could we get around this censorship? Could we use you know, virtual private networks? Could we use these different anti-censorship tools? To me, it really seemed like the problem 10 years ago was, are we all going to get this opportunity to speak? Uh, and the other project I was working on was, was the first project that, that the Knight Foundation supported with me, which was uh, Global Voices. Yeah. And so that's a network that's now 12 years out into the world. I'm going to be off to Colombo, Sri Lanka to meet 400 of our volunteers. We should tell people weeks. a little bit about what it is. So Global Voices uh, is basically a community of people 
who monitor citizen media all over the world and then share their perspectives on what conversations are taking place. So rather than me looking at Pakistan as an American Christian and going, Pakistan, isn't that where terror comes from? I can have Pakistani authors saying, actually, there's this really cool conversation in Lahore right now about this new art gallery opening, mm -hmm. and here's how we're talking about women in education, and these are the conversations happening. So I was hugely enthusiastic about this idea that these tools were going to keep getting better once everybody had smartphones, once everybody has connectivity, everyone was going to become a content creator. We were all going to become publishers. Susan, I know I'm not allowed to say content creator, but we were <laughs> all going to be putting information out in the world. And I have to say... Um, but don't we all do that through Facebook? So we do, and, and, and here's the interesting thing. Once we get to the point where billions of us are producing information, sometimes it's a Facebook post, sometimes it's Instagram, sometimes it's you know even, even a like or a share, is information of a sort. So we're all publishers right now, and there's one big problem, which is that no one has changed the supply of attention. And so instead of just having professional publishers, newspapers, people with business models competing for my attention, my friends are competing for my attention. Students are competing for my attention. Someone who came up with the latest, greatest cute cat video is also <laughs> competing for my attention. And at this point, I think the problem that I am most terrified about is really simple. It's filtering. How do we decide what information is worth paying attention to? Oh, but Facebook will do that for you. you you've noticed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've noticed that. Yeah. So, so look. So they solved that problem. So here's the really interesting thing about this. So, so first of all, if you're a regular Facebook user and you haven't done this, try this experiment. There is a button on Facebook's news feed. You can switch between the most recent and the news feed order. And it's pretty incredible. I have less than 15% overlap between what Facebook shows me and what the people I follow are actually telling me. And the reason for this is that Facebook is very concerned about me. <laughs> Facebook really wants to only give me information that I'm going to care about. And so they look for certain things. They look for friends who posted something that's getting a lot of comments or a lot of reactions. They make sure I've seen that, even if that's four or five days old. They really want to make sure that I get it. If I haven't liked someone or particularly looked at their pictures for a while, they may just sort of fall out of my feed. Um, Eli Pariser started calling this the filter bubble and, and sort of making the case that Facebook takes this tendency we have to pay attention to people who are a lot like us, homophily, and just sort of strengthens it. But the truth is there's a whole lot of other problems that come down to being filtering problems. Fake news is a filtering problem. If we decide we want Facebook to identify and pick our news out and give us only the true stuff, we've asked Facebook to do more filtering for us. Fake news also, by the way, only really ends up being a problem because Facebook filters for stuff that's highly viral. And so it sort of makes it up the chain. A lot of what we deal with, with toxic abuse and harassment online, is a failure of platforms like Twitter and also Facebook to give us filters that we have access to and that we can control. Well, wait a second, don't you want to know all the viral stuff? I don't get it. So the viral stuff that has a whole bunch of people telling me to kill myself because I work for George Soros and Open Society Foundation, I can probably do without that most <laughs> days. Uh, although I have to say, the nice thing about being a man online is that my worst days online are generally what outspoken women call Monday. Um, so you know there is that certain gender privilege there around that. But yeah, it would be really nice if people had the ability to sort of come in and say, I am being abused in this. Help me block people who are making it impossible for me to use this service. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, what I'm really interested in. So, what do we do? Go be well, with Facebook? Well, so, so, so here's the thing, right? Facebook, as well as all these other networks, could make it possible for us to filter. And we know that they can. And the reason we know that they can is that the advertising industry is the most amazing filtering mechanism anyone has ever seen. 
right? So I'm guessing a lot of people in the audience here read J.D. Vance, right? So we're all concerned now that we're not paying attention to Appalachia, all these unheard voices out there. I can go on Facebook and say, I want to target 20 to 35-year-old white men from Appalachia who voted for Trump, and I can start sending ads to them. What I can't do is say, you know, I'd like to read these people's feeds and find out what they're talking about. I'd like the chance to become friends with them. I'd like to follow them. I'd like to listen to them. We can filter when we're willing to pay for it, but we don't have good tools for filtering what we hear from and what we do. Um, so we, we built something oh. recently. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can, can I pull up the video on this? Oh, so let's we, find out. We launched this thing uh, earlier today. It's called Gobo. Uh, we just very quickly went past uh, the fact that this is a research project and that you have to sign an IRB form to play with it. But what Gobo does is it basically Was that says, a click-through agreement? Uh, just no. Ask. Well, it is. It's Facebook's click-through agreement. Okay, okay. So to use this, you link your Facebook, you link your Twitter to it, and we pull in your feeds, and we suddenly give you this ability to start filtering them. And you'll see at the very top, you'll see that a few posts are already filtered out. You can see associated with each post, it says Wait, why I am saw, I seeing Wait, I saw this? one that said uh, filtered by gender. Well, so that, that turns out to be because right now the gender is set very, very far towards having a lot of women's voices. So you can actually essentially say, I hear too much from men online. Let's move that slider over. We actually added a mute all men button. I think that may actually be my favorite button on the internet right now. There's also a brands button. If you'd like, you can shut off the brands. But there's also sliders like virality and seriousness. And what we're doing here is we're using really bad machine learning. These are really crappy, off-the-shelf algorithms. We could work much harder and make them much better. But this isn't a product. This is a provocation. And the provocation is to basically say, why is it that we don't get to do this, LaTanya? Like, why is it that we have entered into this contract with these companies that basically say, we have your best interests at heart, we're going to do things for you, and then they close the box? We don't get to see how Facebook is adjusting those levers. Why don't I have the opportunity? Why don't I have the right to come in and start playing with those levers myself and decide whether one day maybe I want my feed to be really silly or another day I want it to be really angry? Why can't I do that? Well, wait, is this a filter of the filter or a filter of unfiltered? So this is a great question. So with Twitter, we're able to get a pretty unfiltered view of it. And then we do what we would call subtractive filtering. So one of the best filters that I find for Twitter is rudeness. <laughs> uh, you can basically <laughs> crank it up so you only get people to a certain level of politeness. That turns out to be very helpful. We also filter in. One of the things that Gobo asks you is it asks you what news you normally read. And then based on the set of publications, if you decide to expand your political point of view, we'll start ending up handing you articles uh, from different sources and sort of filtering it into it. One of the real problems is that we can't filter Facebook at this point because Facebook doesn't like to let you play with their tools unless you're within their environment. So from Facebook, we get pages. We get the public pages that you like, and we can filter those. But we don't, at this point, get your friends' posts. I see. And to do that, we may have to break a couple of rules. Oh, so well, we're thinking about that. I, I, just Be between careful. you and me, I don't okay, want, okay, yeah. want anyone yeah. else to I don't want, I, know that we're... I don't we're, want MIT sued. I'm no, just no, no, saying. I, I, the no. worst thing in the world would be having Facebook come after an academic institution asking <laughs> the question of why we can't get access to our own social graph and the posts from our own friends. That would be a terrible case to have to argue. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, but I... I so. But let me turn this back to you, Latana. I mean, how do we get from the things that scare us and piss us off to the solutions? This isn't a solution, but at least it's a provocation. It's a way of sort of opening the question about, do we have the right to shape our own information? How do we do this around privacy? How do we do this about, uh, about personally identifiable information? So, you know, a lot of the work that I've done uh, in this kind of showing unforeseen consequences 
giving it air, sometimes it is disruptive and we have had a long, lot of practice of businesses getting better at what they do because they've sort of been shamed into it. Yeah. Uh, and maybe that might get yeah, there maybe. too. Yeah. Um, but also sometimes doing things like this and sort of putting it out there in their face. Also, in, we've got lots of uh, evidence and examples of where you then ignite a lot of really brilliant people to work on that problem. So data privacy has yeah. been one of those areas. And you know, when we first started out with those, with uh, re-identifying yeah. your governor's medical record, and then you end up with differential privacy, which is a stronger privacy today. Um, it ignites a lot of smart thinkers. Spend just a moment on differential privacy. Differential privacy for a lot of people in this room is like one of the most interesting ideas that you haven't heard. And given <laughs> yeah. that you've been working on that for a while, like, like give, us, give us a quick. Well, I, I don't want, um, you know, there, there are many ways. So, there, so back in 1997, showing how vulnerable data was started uh, the idea of, well, then how do you fix this? How do you share data where well, you can make some guarantees of anonymity? And, um, and so computer scientists over that time, I started with the first model and people have come up with other models. Today, the operant model is differential privacy, which is simply the idea of making sure that any of the outlier information is not, going to, is not present in the data. Um, I have less than a minute, so that's my nutshell. Part, part of the way that I, I sort of tell people about it is that if, if I have full access to a data set, if I can keep querying it over and over and over again, I'm always going to be able to de-anonymize it. If I have a limited number of bytes at the Apple, and particularly if I'm looking mostly at data that's sort of right in the main corpus and that maybe is hidden by noise that's been generated for it, there's ways around it. But my point in this, and the reason I wanted to end on this, was we are not just grumpy, miserable <laughs> grouches. We are super paranoid people who enjoy looking at where these technologies are taking us and looking at the unintended consequences so that we can find ways to push back against them. And what I found so inspiring about your work starting 20 years ago was the idea that you were out there identifying these problems and saying these are solvable, we can do something about this, because that next step, that's the one that I think is so important. And, and, the, and our students that have come over the last 20 years have really demonstrated that. You know, from everything from algorithmic fairness and how do you, um, how do you com detect discrimination and prices and so forth. And we have a long history of students actually doing that so that in the end, everyone can have sort of the vision that Susan Crawford talks about with technology without the harms. But this work of, uh, of finding these unforeseen consequences, airing them out, dealing with them, um, has to be done. So props to the Knight Foundation for making bets on grumpy academics who can make <laughs> things better. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so thanks, much. Susan. Thank you. It's great. Thank you.